that brings to mind the, the Mayan uh, villages around Lago Arilan in Guatemala, you know, that were sort of, that were far enough away from Spanish colonization that they sort of remained relatively intact and have that notion of feeding the holy. You know, the idea is that we do consume, we hunt, we fish, we chop down trees, we do all of these things. And rather than thinking that we've been cast out of the garden and need to atone for that, we understand that reciprocity that you're talking about and we give back. And in the Almost gifting... Every, indigenous societies never think of people as part of the problem. People are the solution. All right. This next episode is with National Geographic explorer in residence and Harvard ethnobotanist Wade Davis. Uh, I don't often fanboy, but when I do, uh, it's for the likes of Wade. He is one of my all-time heroes from decades ago. He was the original or the protege student of Dr. Richard Evan Schultes, who was basically the model for Indiana Jones. He was the original 1930s ethnobotanist at Harvard, you know, burrowing in his lab and then disappearing down to the Amazon, working through World War II, discovering rubber for the CIA, all these kinds of wild and crazy things. And then, as Wade told me in this episode, heading out on his under, in his graduate summers to study the peyote cult in Oklahoma. So tripping balls on peyote and then coming back to Harvard knowing what he was looking for and really opening up the beginnings of the academic psychedelic lineage. Uh, Wade himself, if you haven't seen, it's my all-time favorite TED Talk from 2003, uh, way back when TED was still in Monterey. And he just basically, uh, Chris Anderson invited him to hop up on stage off the cuff and Wade delivers this utterly profound 22 minutes of his both photography, his ethnographies and studies in the Amazon, and makes the case of that we're very acutely attuned to the loss of the ecosphere, the environment, but equally important is the loss of the ethnosphere and languages and culture. And while Wade is a scholar, he is also a poet. And whenever he opens his mouth, uh, just absolute um, beauty comes out in, in a fire hose of the most crazy adventure stories from all around the world you've ever heard. So uh, if I had had a different life where he would be someone I would have wanted to be when I grew up and uh, the fact that we got to chat and jam, including like true Indiana Jones stories of like Nazi agents convening in Oaxaca at the same time that um, uh, Gordon Wasson, the vice president of J.P. Morgan, is down there looking for Maria Sabina and the secret to psychedelic mushrooms. Um, Wade is just nonstop on adventure, insight, uh, scholarly wisdom, and everything else. So buckle your seatbelt and jump in. And in the meantime, uh, definitely go check out uh, his TED Talks and, and pretty much everything else. He's also written a Rolling Stone article about the collapse of, of American or Western civilization this last year that has gone absolutely viral. So um, he is a polymath Renaissance man and a hell of a, a, hell of a good conversationalist. So Wade, Wade Davis is a Harvard trained ethnobotanist, a National Geographic explorer in residence, a current professor at the University of British Columbia, and an all-around Renaissance man, adventurer, and scholar in the old mold. Uh, so Wade, you've, you've had a big impact on my life, my thinking, and my work over the years. Um, I'm delighted and honored to be able to get to sit with you. Uh, welcome to Homegrown Humans. Well, thanks, Jamie. I think the operative word is old. You know, Dennis, McK <laughs> Dennis McKenna and I always joke that you just have to live long enough. And before you know it, you're the um, the venerable sage that everybody's looking up to. And you're still thinking like a little kid looking up at your predecessors, you know. And, and Dennis and I tease each other about that because we've been friends for so long. And we had such kind of reverence on... Uh, for individuals like Albert Hoffman and Gordon Wasson and, and, and Professor Schultes and a host of others, you know, and sometimes I think if you just live long enough, you, you suddenly enter into the, um, into the steps of the, of the mentor. It's, it's kind of a glorious place to be in a way. Yeah, absolutely. And, and that's something that I'm actually writing about in my current book is just how in the current psychedelic Renaissance and the emphasis on sort of transformational culture and all those kind of things that, there is a what what at least I perceive being a Gen Xer in the middle of it is a is a generational knowledge gap or wisdom gap and and I and the story I, I tell myself is that there's a degree of kind of parental 
individuation in the sense that millennials, you know, every generation separates from what their parents did, thinks that anything that their parents did can't be cutting edge, edgy, or cool. And that when they come to something, they're the first on the planet to have discovered it. <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and there's a sort of echo boom voltage drop between what happened in the 50s through the 70s and what's happening now. And there's, there's a lot of lost knowledge and something. Yeah. I, oh, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, I, I think that's so true, Jamie. It's, it's very interesting. I mean, even in Michael Pollan's book, um, which I actually didn't read because I just never got around to it, but it strikes me there's an element of, um, of, of um, stumbling upon something that was new to him, yet almost naively so. Like, it's like, it, you know, for someone who first takes psychedelics in this moment in time, I, I, there's an element, is, what, what have you been doing all these years, you know? <laughs> you know? <laughs> No, but I mean, in, in seriousness, I think, I mean, it's, every generation has to find its own path. But I, but I do think it's worth remembering these pioneers, if only to remember um, what, how, how unique they were in their vision. I mean, it, it's, it's, um, it's remarkable to think that back as recently as the 1930s, the only uh, volume available that described the stunning pharmacological effects of mescaline and peyote was Henrik Kluver's monograph that Schulte stumbled upon as a young student. I, so these guys were very much working in a void. I'm talking, you know, pre-Timothy Leary and Richard Albert. I, I mean, oh, yeah. these early, early explorers, um, you know, Schulte's and Weston Labar, who went out to work with the roadmen of the of the Kiowa and the Native American Church, as it became um, codified, um, they had no reference points. They, you know, they they were taking these psychedelics, and uh, um, they, they had no one to tell them what this was all about. You know, and 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 they were such an eclectic cadre. I mean, Gordon Wasson, the the you know the vice president of Morgan Guarantee Trust, Albert Hoffman, this very serious scientist over there in Basel, Switzerland. And the way Sasha Shulgin, you know, uh, mm -hmm. uh, all these great characters, and but they really kind of came out of nowhere. This eclectic group, and then they mm -hmm. they birthed the the potential for what became the psychedelic era. And I think it's worth looking back too to remember that these people were, in many ways, heroic. You know, um, Tim Leary, for example, um, sort of reduced to caricature, as if he's sort of an Andy Warhol figure, you know, turn on, tune in, drop out and everything. But people forget that Tim was a very serious social psychologist. And um, even though he didn't have the academic position that Richard Albert did, I think I think Ram Dass would have always agreed that Tim was a real intellectual visionary. And just at that moment, a critical moment, a study had come out saying that no matter what the psychiatric um, ailment and no matter what the intervention a third of patients got better and a third stayed the same and a third got worse. And they both of them had a kind of crisis of confidence right at the moment when Tim Leary opened the Life magazine with the article written by Gordon Wasson with the snappy title picked by an editor at Life, Seeking the Magic Mushrooms. He made a beeline for Cuernavaca, <laughs> ate the mushrooms and came back transformed. And just as Gordon Wasson said, again, you have to think of these individuals Taking these substances, you know, they're not taking them as I did. You know, I mean, I was sort of influenced by the airplane, the dead. In the early 70s, there was a whole psychedelic culture I wanted to be a part of, in part as a teenager growing up at that time. There were multiple reference points, if only in the in the sort of psychedelic uh, uh, music of the era, from Pepper to, to the dead, right? These people were taking these substances very much in a void. And when Wasson first took mushrooms, he was just completely speechless. He said, you know, words do not exist. It's like trying to tell a blind man what it's like to see. And, and <laughs> I, I find it fascinating to think of those, those, those individuals um, on that kind of unique and very uh, eclectic uh, and esoteric quest. I mean, when Schultes discovered the mushrooms, it's a story right out of Indiana Jones. I yeah. don't know if you know, Jamie. I mean, you know, he, 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 he was a kid at Harvard. Uh, to, from too modest a family to even attend the dorms. Uh, he commuted from his tenement in East Boston. He had to make money, so he took a job filing cards in probably the most extraordinary library then in North America, the Library of Economic Botany at the Botanical Museum. And between the kind of 
folios of, of Brunfels and the monographs of distant tribes and the accounts of these strange psychoactive plants, he kind of fell away into trance. And he took the course that had been taught at Harvard longer than any other, Plants and Human Affairs. And the professor, Oakes Ames, who was a great libertarian, hated the U.S., the domination of the U.S. government. And so throughout all the months and years of prohibition, as one of the laboratory um, uh, experiments, the students had to distill and ferment and drink copious amounts of alcohol during the height of prohibition. And yet when it came to these curious <laughs> plants that were known as the Fantastica, according to Lewis Lewin in that great early monograph, um, even P Professor Ames had his, has, had his limits. And so the kids had to do a book report. Schultes had so much homework that he rushes to the back of the room, gets the thinnest volume, puts it into his satchel, goes home to East Boston, and that night botanical history is made because that turned out to be Kluver's monograph on mescaline and peyote. And, and as he read it through these visions of sort of orb-like brilliance that flooded over the consciousness, he was entranced, and he came back the next day and said to Professor Ames, I must study this plant for my undergraduate thesis. And Ames said, you can, but you must know it and you must live it. And that's how in the summer of 19, um, I guess it was 30, 33, 34, Weston Labar and Schultes, Labar being an anthropology student from Yale, in this beat up 1928 Studebaker, found themselves bouncing over the dusty trails of Tennessee en route to Indian country in Oklahoma where the two of them, these young lads from the Ivy League, uh, Schultes had never been west of the Charles River, ate peyote four and five nights a week for eight weeks of their young lives. And they came back, needless to say, uh, men transformed. And it was while Schultes was doing his research at the National Herbarium in Washington uh, on peyote that he, st he stumbled upon the, the clue to solve the greatest mystery in um, in ethnobotanical history. And that was, of course, the identity of these long lost Aztec plants, Tehuanacatl and Oroluiki, you know, the flesh of the gods and the serpent vine. And there had been a famous anthropologist at the Smithsonian by the name of Safford, who claimed that Tehuanacatl was in fact peyote. And Schultes was loyal to the early Spanish chroniclers, and he thought this was nonsense, but he couldn't challenge his leading academic until he found amazingly, uh, a letter uh, attached to a herbarium specimen of peyote addressed to the former director of the herbarium, the late Dr. Rose. And the letter said very simply, Dear Dr. Rose, I understand your man Safford says Tehuanacatl is peyote. He's an idiot. It's a mushroom. I've seen it used. Yours sincerely, B.P. Rako. <laughs> well, Schultz, you know, who was this Rako? He was this uh, kind of the unknown German engineer in Mexico. And Schultes made a beeline for Mexico City, uh, hooked up with Reiko, and together they made they marched into the back country of Oaxaca to live amongst the Mazatec. And en route, Schultes discovered that uh, Reiko is an ardent Nazi. And this yes. is literally Okay, so so this is the story. So so who is the fellow who was with us at the conference in Vancouver that has a ponytail who's just been down in the Amazon for years and years? I can't remember. I, uh, but he was telling me this story that there was a box of letters found in Mexico City that had like it was literally Indiana Jones in the sense of like Nazi mysticism, but it was Nazi psychedelic mysticism that attracted all the way down to Oaxaca. So this is the same story. I think. Well, it's it's part of the same. You know, at, at that time, uh, you know, whether Reiko was actually affiliated formally with the German government at that time or whether he was just um, by sentiment a Nazi. Um, but he certainly was, and and uh, uh, um, and Schultes, Schultes and he were sort of. Remember, this is 1938, so it's a year before the invasion of Poland. Yeah. And as they make, make their way into Wautla, this small village in Oaxaca, um, there's another team seeking the same identity of this magic mushroom, and that's led by Bernard Bevan, who is Ernst Bevan's brother. And Ernst Bevan would be in Churchill's wartime cabinet. And rumors were that they were British Secret Service. And so you had this scenario of these two teams converging on this little Mazatec community in pursuit of the identity of Tehuanacatl. And actually what happened is that um, the British team, uh, together with a young anthropologist from Berkeley uh, by the name of Johnson, 
um, were the first to actually witness a ceremony, but they didn't collect the mushrooms. It was Schultes who found the actual mushrooms and created the link um, that the mushrooms were, in fact, the, the, the holy sacrament involved. So, and, so, so wait, so, so where, uh, does, where does Gordon Wasson come in? Is Schultes there prior yeah. to Wasson? No, no, then here's, here's a crazy story is that, OK, so so Schultes publishes in both the Botanical Museum leaflets and then a, then a, in, in the American Anthropologist in 1940. But, you know, a, 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 a paper on on, you know, the discovery of a hallucinogenic mushroom at the time when people didn't even know what that meant uh, with Europe uh, ablaze in war hardly warranted attention. And Schultes, meanwhile, went off to the Amazon in pursuit of the botanical sources of Karari, but then got caught up, of course, in the wartime emergency um, seeking rubber. natural rubber yeah. after the Japanese had taken control of 95 percent of the world's supply. And it was only after the war. Um, and by that point, Johnson had been killed in the landings of North Africa. Reiko murdered mysteriously in the streets of Mexico City. And the threat of the whole mystery was picked up by Gordon Wasson, who was this banker in New York. And he was married to uh, a Russian, Russian woman. Yeah. And, you know, Russians love mushrooms. And, and he was an amateur scholar in the best tradition of that. And he, he was he thought that somewhere in the world there were people that worshipped mushrooms. He didn't know where or how. He would later write a, a, a seminal book on Soma, suggesting that the ancient um, uh, sacrament of the Vedic scriptures was in fact Amanita muscaria. Right? Okay, so 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 what's your update on that? That to me that trail runs cold and it becomes deeply ambivalent and no one really knows. And the people who have tried to recreate comparable state experiences with Amanita come up short. So what happened is is somehow. The poet Robert Graves, living on Majorca. Dude, dude Robert Graves. Father. Robert Graves is my OG hero, for sure. Well, I feel like he's he what he's what Joe Campbell uh, wanted to be when he grew up. Yeah, well, he he he. Uh, I know a lot about Robert Graves. I wrote about him in um, a book, Into the Silence, because he was a great friend of Sassoon and Wilfred Owen, you know, huh. and all that saga. But. Um, um, you know, Graves had been uh, left for dead at the Battle of the Somme. You know, um, his entire back had been blown out and uh, he was left in a pile of corpses and he managed to survive days like that. He must have been a very interesting man. But he left England after the war and never went back. But the thing is, he somehow had a copy of Schulte's paper, which he sent on to Wasson. And that's what connected the two men. And then Wasson calls up Schulte's and Schulte says, go down to Oaxaca and look up this Maria Salina, the, the legendary curandera, which Wasson does. Wasson then does three trips to, to Oaxaca, and on the third, he finally is able to ingest the mushrooms in sacred context. And um, he, he writes that up for Life magazine. And as I said, you know, an editor picked the snappy title, Seeking the Magic Mushrooms, and the kind of the psychedelic gold rush was on. But that was the link. And so, and so Graves is in the pudding as well, huh? Yeah, and it even gets more interesting, actually, because, okay, once they had the mushrooms and they had identified them botanically, the question is, what is this cause of this, of, what, is, what is the cause of these, these, these violent um, hallucinations? What's the chemical ingredient, you know? And they did a number of uh, attempts to identify it uh, futilely, and they finally decided Schultes had a contact with Albert Hoffman at, at, ba at Sandoz Labs in Basel. And so the two of them, Wasson and Schultes, sent Hoffman, uh, I think it was 46 mushrooms, and Hoffman fed half the mushrooms to his dog, and nothing happened. So he ate the other half, and something did happen. The landscape. <laughs> you mean a whole like, supply? So he ate like 20 full caps kind of thing? Yeah, yeah. And then he got obviously very intoxicated, and he said the land escape outside his window his lab began to look like mexico the pencil in the hand of his assistant looked like an obsidian blade and they feared he might be swept away into the whirlwind of color and never come back but such an experience might have unnerved an ordinary scientist but of course hoffman wasn't ordinary he had been working for years on the indole alkaloids derived from ergot the parasitic um, uh, fungi that that uh, uh, is found on rye crops and that 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 fungus was known as St. Anthony's fire, or at least the syndrome caused by it, because what would happen, and this goes back to the Middle Ages, periodically small villages would go crazy. Um, people it was, it was LS, LSA, right? It was the the active? Well, what it was is it was it was it was um, 
no one knew what it was. That was the point. And they had identified these ergot alkaloids and uh, Hoffman. And, and of course, because one of the symptoms of the of the, the mania was that tissues would get necrotic, noses would fall off, fingers would fall off. And it was obviously a very powerful vasoconstrictor that could have medical applications, particularly for women who hemorrhage after childbirth. And that was what Sandoz was interested in the drug for. And Hoffman had synthesized a, a, a whole series. His job was actually to learn how to synthesize it. They had extracted it. So, so, so wait, so, so Hoffman had eaten heroic doses of mushrooms prior to him synthesizing LSD and having his famous place. No, 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 on the contrary, on the contrary. He huh? had initially, remember, this is going on in the, 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 the Mexican adventure with Wasson 50. takes place in the, in the 50s, 1956, 1955, I can't remember exactly which year. And uh, but it was way back during 1940, 1940s and culminating in 1943 yeah. and when 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 Hoffman one day in his lab uh, felt a little dizzy and he felt he had to go home and uh, uh, he didn't have a car because of wartime shortages of, of fuel. And so he rode his bicycle home. And that turned out to be the most momentous bicycle trip in history, because on the way home, he went on the world's first acid trip, because what had happened is that the the, the uh, LSD-25 had seeped into his skin, right? Now, the fascinating thing is when jump ahead 10 years and uh, uh, when he's, he gets the mushrooms and he very quickly isolates psilocybin and psilocin, right, as the active constituents. But, he, but he's also he's got a he, somatic marker. He knows what the hell is happening because he's already had the LSD experience. Versus like, I don't know what. Possible. Exactly. So the mushroom experience didn't come out of out of out of the blue. He, he he could recognize it and know what it was and not be afraid of it, as he describes in his book. Um, but the interesting thing is that when he then turns to the identity of the second of the sacred plants, Ololuiki, which Schultes had also identified botanically and collected and shown that it was a morning glory, uh, not really a, a great deal different um, than our our the uh, garden varieties. Um, uh, then we began to extract the active ingredient there. What he found, he could scarcely believe his eyes. He thought he had polluted the samples with other material from his lab because it turned out that the active constituent of Oluwiki, the serpent vine, were, were only a couple methyl groups, if I recall, removed from LSD. So in a sense, Schultes had discovered LSD in nature, in a sense, um, uh, 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 five years before Hoffman synthesized it in the lab, only Schultes had found it in a humble morning glory worship by the Aztec as a god incarnate. Wow. And so this, and this is also what Oliver Sacks ends up dabbling in when he writes, I think, that piece for the New Yorker of his experiences in, in L.A. on morning glory tea and having the full... Mm -hmm. A full hallucination of a non-ordinary. Well, you know, and then, and, and and then and then of course, you know, when 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 Tim Leary comes along with the, the great experiments and everything, um, it, it it kind of um, uh, it, it cracks crack, cracks open the sky and it raises, you know, one one of the really haunting things about all this and, and why why the Renaissance today is is both uh, ex encouraging but also precarious is that, you know, these substances are inherently subversive. If you think in, 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 in the sense that, you know, uh, Joseph Campbell famously drew a distinction between shamanic religions, whereby the role of the shaman is essentially to catalyze the and release the wild genius of the individual wherever that may go, whereas, of course, the priest's job is to socialize the congregation into a religious ideology, largely for state control, and and um, uh, so so the, these hallucinogens are inherently subversive. I mean, I remember when our when our um, when my our parents in the in the sixties and seventies would say, you know, don't use these things; you'll never come back the same. Well, they didn't understand that was the whole point. And and uh, when you when you um, it's fascinating to me, Jamie, that when you look at the the incredible social changes that came about uh, women in a generation going from the kitchen to the boardroom, people of color from the woodshed to the White House, gay people from the altar, I mean, from the closet to the altar, um, children beginning to speak in terms of Gaia, the biosphere, biodiversity, all of these changes, which in many ways are the sociological equivalent of splitting the atom, 
um, came about uh, in, 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 in incredible rapid succession in historic terms. And yet when we look back on that trajectory, the one uh, ingredient in the recipe of social change that we've seen to expunge from the record is that tens of millions of us lay prostrate before the gates of awe, having taken some psychedelic. Now, you know, people use psychedelics in different ways. I mean, some people quite, quite uh, judiciously and thoughtfully find that the use of these substances periodically throughout their life is, is a f fabulous medicine, a teaching tool. Others, like Ramdas, um, you know, famously said, get the message and hang up. In other words, as George Harrison did, as the Beatles did, except for John Lennon. I mean, there was a sense, okay, you, you get you get it, uh, now what? You know, and, and many people, of course, turn to Eastern religion in, in, in that era. Haitians used to say to me, you know, you white people go to church and speak about God. We hear the Indians eat plants and speak to God. We dance in the temple and become God. Oh shit! Okay, because I'd already had the Quanah Parker, the, the the first half of that for for my current book that I'm writing, but the the Haitian build on that takes it is perfect because it's the it's the it's the grammar of the pronouns. It's first person, second person, third person relationship yeah. to the divine. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, that's brilliant. That's, and, a, that's and, outstanding. And if, you, well, if you spend time as I have in Haiti or or other. Um, uh, countries in the Americas with, you know, with the African um, foundations um, from Brazil to to um, Jamaica, uh, but certainly in West Africa, you, you know, this spirit possession is 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 the hand of divine grace. I mean, you know, it's a, a very powerful transformative um, technique of ecstasy. Well, I'd love to. I mean, there's a million different branches and paths of, of what you've already laid out, and, and it, I'd love to explore them all. Um, let's just clarify that because then, I mean, A, I've never heard, I've never heard the, the thesis of Western hemispherical, like the disproportionate representation of, of entheogens in this hemisphere and its relationship to other psychotechnologies. And I'm imagining presumably interior contemplative trans and mm -hmm. ecstatic traditions of, of the Eastern hemisphere and that that being a potential driver of discovery and adoption of use is that something you have formally articulated anywhere is is, is that part sure, of the literature and a body of knowledge oh yeah i mean i think that's that's that, that kind of anomaly is is well reported in the literature and always has been there um i mean uh, you, you have the somas you have the hashish you have you you have you have you have, you have a boga you have well, varying yeah. things oh you have, you have exceptions i mean i mean hashish i wouldn't really classify any of the cannabinols as truly entheogenic in that sense. Um, soma, soma is, is, you know, the fly agaric is, is the one exception, of course, is the shamanic traditions of Siberia and the use of fly agaric, which, you know, it's, 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 it's not clear, frankly, if you really talk to linguists and friends of mine who work in Siberia, it's not clear how widespread the use of of, of, of amanita and muscaria really was, and it can be very toxic, right? Um, uh, but certainly, it's, it's, it's got something pretty gnarly. Uh, uh, muscarine, muscarine. It's, but the, but the you know the one exception, of course, is um, e e ibogaine or iboga in in Ecuador, West Africa, which is definitely used as a as an entheogenic transformed plant. So I'm not saying there are no substances there, but if you look at the, you know, the San Pedro cactus, peyote, ayahuasca, the uh, ebene, um, um, the mushrooms, um, you know, these, these are, these are new world things. I mean, one important point is what I was saying is that, you know, e even though indigenous people respond to this universal desire to change consciousness, there's no question that the use of the substances, particularly ayahuasca, is always within a social context whereby the, um, you know, the, the, the ceremony is, is a collective journey into the divine. You know, you don't, you don't see in the Amazon, except in pure shamanic initiations, where the individual may go off into the forest and just, um, in the case of the Kofan, they may in fact, uh, bring themselves to the edge of, 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 of death with ingestion of, of, um, uh, of, uh, uh, uh tree daturas, you know, um, the, the tree of the evil eagle, jaguars and toxic. And, uh, Randy Borman, who is the chief of the Kofan 
complicated story, but he was, told me that he knew of an individual who went off uh, in quest of the shamanic vision of the Kofan, and he literally had a dugout canoe, which he filled with macerated a decoction of um, tree datura with scopolamine and atropine. I mean, the, 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 these are dangerous drugs. I mean, they, they bring on an induced state of psychotic delirium, visions of hellfire, a burning thirst, uh, blindness, a total, <laughs> yeah. a sense of uh, flying, possibly blindness, amnesia. You know, I mean, they're, they're generally seen as the, the the drug of last recourse by the shaman who, with the idea that just touching the realm of madness unleashed by the drug, you achieve some kind of illumination. I have never known anyone who has used those drugs who would ever use them again. And people like Schultes were wise enough never to use them in the first place. And I followed his lead. I would never take a datura. Yeah, I'd have to feel like Castaneda did a lot to encourage folks down that down that road that they probably shouldn't have known. Well, the problem with Castaneda, he made it all up. And, you know, I remember when his first book came out, um, I was long before, uh, you know, it was passed off as his PhD at UCLA. I knew people who were on his committee. Um, um, and But even as a young student of botany under Schultes, where you, you certainly learned your botany if you're a student of Schultes, the, the appendix in that book, which was sort of the meat of his thesis, if you will, uh, was so crazy in terms of his botanical identifications. He had everything wrong. And we now know, of, you know, mushrooms and conflated with peyote. And, and uh, we now know, of course, that, you know, the, 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 the yaki are, are, are nothing like he described. And, and of course now, but, but, you know, at the time, the books were taken very seriously. And, 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 and I remember when I was a, a studying anthropology as a sophomore, a separate reality was one of our textbooks. And it was presented as a legitimate a true monograph by a legitimate anthropologist. And one of the reasons that it became so difficult to write first-person accounts in the in the time when I wrote The Serpent and the Rainbow about my experience in Haiti was that Castaneda cast a long shadow and people really felt betrayed by him yeah. within the academy, you know, because, because you know, as, as literature, the books, some of them were wonderful. But the fact that he... And we now know probably, you know, he, he grew up in Cajamarca, in northern Peru. Much of what he wrote about was probably inspired from Moncabamba and the and the contemporary healing cult of the Cactus of the Four Winds um, in in Moncabamba and and uh, in the mountains of Las Huaringas. Mm -hmm. So it's a, yeah, I mean, it felt, it felt like a sort of pure trickster play, you know. Totally. That <laughs> that, that, that he was having, he what he, it, it's like a Kizzy's opening to One Flew the Cuckoo's Nest, where he has Chief Bromden say, and it's the truth, even if it didn't happen. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think, and it also fed into, you know, there was a kind of a hysteria at that era where uh, anthropologists were looking and finding hallucinogens everywhere. You know, I remember once when I was traveling with Tim Plowman. Uh, in the mountains of Ecuador, I came upon this plant that Schultes said, you know, uh, said was hallucinogenic. So, you know, as T Schultes used to say that Tim and I ate our way through South America. And so I <laughs> took this big wallop of these of these uh, seeds of cor uh, Coriaria, the plant, the genus it was. And I got back to the campfire and I told Tim I've just taken this big wallop of Coriaria. And he said, what did you do that for? And I said, well, Schultes said they're hallucinogenic. He said, oh, he says everything's hallucinogenic. It could just be poison. And I said, oh, too late. <laughs> 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 you know, the, um, but so there was that sort of thing. I mean, the same thing with the, the misrepresentation of Bufo Marinus as hallucinogenic, you know, something that Andy Weil and I finally sort of solved um, and, and revealed that the Mayan, Mayan uh, archaeologists who had been suggesting that Bufo Marinus was a psychoactive substance had had been um, confused and were referring to the wrong species of the genus Bufo. So is it Bufo alvarius? Was it, was it the siren? Yeah. So, so actually, let's. There's there's two threads I definitely want to come back to. The first is just to clarify Western hemispherical stuff, because at least in my understanding, and tell me, tell me if I'm missing something. Um, it would feel like it could be even compressed down to the quadrant of Central and South America, because like the the peyote cult starts in northern Mexico. It's not until the era of reservations and railroads and those kind of things that it really comes up into what we would call the lower 48. I'm unaware of any long-standing tradition by, by the way like in, in grad school my advisor was vine deloria jr so i worked with with the lakota world and then what well, you know, kind of part of that the, scene. The, plain, 
the Plains cultures had the mezcal bean, you know, which was more of an ordeal. And um, um, again, it's a, it's that fine line, you know, where, where where you know what is a hallucinogen, what is a poison. You know, Schultes always quotes <laughs> herself, exactly. who said that yeah. poison in medicine and narcotic is just dosage. And uh, um, you know, you you point out really really properly that the you know the 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 use of these substances is frozen in time, and and the the spread of peyote. Uh, came about in the Great Plains in the wake of the collapse of traditional um, um, indigenous life as a kind of pharmacological shortcut to the distant realms that had been reached by the vision quest and by the sun dance and by the ingestion of the toxic beings. And again, you know, you know, people, you know, often will ingest toxic plants um, with the idea that um, either impurities will be uh, revealed. I mean, you know, in, in, in Africa, famously, amongst the Calamance people, everybody had to um, eat the toxic calabar bean, physostigmine, which has physostigmine in it once a year. And there was a significant morbidity and mortality. And the mescal bean was a little bit like that. It's this ordeal. And if you survive the ordeal, you must be blessed by the divine. Um, but, but you're right. I mean, I think part of that is just the, um, you know, the Remember that the, the the research again that that, that it was concentrated in a handful of individuals, Reichel Domatov in Colombia, Schultes in Mexico, and Colombia. You know, um, my friends amongst the Haida uh, maintained that the Haida used certain substances um, in in this sort of ordeal way. But we don't really have much evidence, for example, that the psilocybin mushrooms, which are ubiquitous today in Haida Gwaii were used aboriginally um, by the Haida. But and again, this just gets back to this idea that the use of these substances is rooted in culture. And, uh, um, you know, one of the one of the things that so fascinated Schultes was the the elaboration of these substances, what they, what they tell us about a, a different way of knowing. So, for example, you know, whenever you try to account for um, this curious fact that ayahuasca, of course, is a combination of substances. It's got the, the woody liana, which is in the genus Banisteriopsis, and then these various admixtures, whether it's Psychotera viridis, a shrub in the coffee family. And the in the case of those two substances, it's very interesting because the active psychoactive agent are the tryptamines, uh, 5-methoxydimethyltryptamine, dimethyltryptamine found in the shrub, and those tryptamines can't be taken orally because they're denatured by an enzyme found in the human stomach, monoamine oxidase. And somehow they learn to combine those leaves with this liana, which happens to have beta carbolines, harmine and harmaline, which are exactly the kind of MAO inhibitors necessary to potentiate the tryptamines. Now, on the face of it, the only uh, scientific explanation for that discovery would be trial and error, which statistically <laughs> is revealed to be a meaningless euphemism. I think probably the answer lies in the fact that further north, the admixture that contains the tryptamines is uh, Diploteris rosbiana, which is, uh, is a liana in the Malpighiaceae, like Banisteriopsis, morphologically very similar. And I think the people further south just began to look around and check out any plant with opposite leaves, because plants in the coffee family all have opposite leaves, and the Malpighiaceae has opposite leaves. So I think that kind of was a a kind of a, a clue, doctrine of signatures kind of thing that led the uh, the experimentation. But the bottom line is that, you know, all of these substances involve deep levels of no of knowledge. I mean, these, these shaman were real natural philosophers. I mean, Karari is another example. You know, you could drink as much Karari as you wanted and nothing would happen to you unless you had a stomach ulcer. Mm -hmm. You know, you have to get it into the blood for it to be efficacious. Well, that's kind of a interesting discovery. It is. And, and so so that brings up indigenous modes of knowing. And, 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 and I want to go down that road, too. But before we do, so there's two examples that come up to me. Well, there's three things. First is Eliade, Sir Machia Eliade's notion of psychedelics or entheogens being corruptions of former, earlier, pure rituals and traditions. Now, obviously, that fate fell out of favor, you know, and, and I think he even retracted it a little bit by the end of his days. But nonetheless, that would that sort of matched mainstream puritanical American norms as well. The idea that using drugs is cheating, skin bag bias or hypothesis. Was Schultes one of the first? Wh wh where's, where does the lineage shift and change to what you were describing as the cultural relativism of saying, hey, these are unique and indigenous life ways. 
you have to take them, you know, you, you don't want to be guilty of upstreaming and project way back into a past something you happen to catch as an yeah, anthropologist, yeah, but yeah, yeah, yeah. unpack I, I think, for that. When, when, when did think, that shift happen? I think the fantastic thing about Schultes is that he was fundamentally a botanist. You know, he never pretended to be an ethnographer. Um, he was fundamentally an economic botanist and a taxonomist. And um, because he found himself in the Northwest Amazon, remember, he went there uh, for medical research um, to try to identify the botanical sources of Karari because in 1943, um, scientists at McGill University had extracted d 2 as a muscle relaxant and were beginning to use it in abdominal surgery. And yet we didn't really know what the botanical source was, right? And Schult that was Schulte's mission. And then he gets caught up in the wartime emergency. And because of that, he has the luxury of spending 12 uninterrupted years in the Amazon ostensibly looking for both sources of latex, but more importantly, disease resistant clones that can be the foundation for a new American based rubber industry. But that gives him license to move freely in the Northwest Amazon, living amongst um, dozens of indigenous people. And he had a very unique position because in many cases, he was the first outsider that these societies had encountered who didn't want to exploit their labor transform their religion or rape their daughters. He was this sort of solitary student of plants um, who developed an extraordinary respect for the people. And, and uh, I, I think they, for, for the indigenous people, you know, it made so much sense that someone would, would come so far to study what they knew to be one of the greatest aspects of their culture, which is their knowledge of the botanical realm upon which their lives depended. So I think Schulte's Schulte's, you know, he, he never, he, he was later kind of colored as an early environmentalist. He wasn't really that at all, but he, he, he did respect the ind indigenous people. He, he believed they should be treated uh, fundamentally fairly. Um, you know, it was a famous case where, where uh, uh, a, a, a native person um, murdered uh, uh, a rubber, a rubber uh, baron, a uh, rubber, you know, um, uh, uh, exploiter, if you will. Who had who had uh, killed some some indigenous people, and to protect that guy, Schultes immediately offered him a job. You know, with, with you know, he's that kind of guy. Um, but I think he just he stood up and said, "This knowledge counts. This knowledge is important. This knowledge is being lost." And at the same time, you had people like Reichel Domatov, his great friend in in Colombia, the the legendary anthropologist and archaeologist, and he was. He was saying there's really something going on here, you know, in these belief systems and and other anthropologists and, and, and even travelers and explorers, um, plant explorers like Richard Spruce, you know, who was the first to report Yahe or ayahuasca, you know, saw the richness of these traditions. You know, yeah. I mean, you know, you, you, you have to understand that, you know, the Barasana and the Makuna and the um, Tanimukas and all the peoples of the Anaconda in the northwest Amazon, you know, they they um, uh, they literally believe that they maintain the energetic flows of the universe. They believe that plants and animals are just people in another dimension of reality. They believe that at the beginning of time, the culture heroes, the four thunders, the Iowa came up the Milk River and um, uh, gave order to the world. Uh, they believe that the Maloka in which they live is echoed in the sky by a universal mo Maloka, which is uh, longhouse anchored at the sacred points. Uh, and when they take ayahuasca, they don't become symbols of the ancestors. They become literally the ancestors. They, they, when, they, they, when they put on a, 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 a corona of yellow feathers, those feathers are not feathers. They are the rays of the sun. They're not signs of the rays of the sun. And they, they journey collectively in their great celebrations to all points of origin of their people. And and uh, uh, celebrating in that sense, their, their their central idea, which is that human beings must maintain the the energetic flows of the earth. Now, this touches upon something you asked about, which is absolutely fundamental. You know, people try to um, ass assess indigenous people as if they're a monolith, uh, and and the way we try to account for their relationship with the natural world is to invoke kind of the cliches of, of, of the speech of Chief Seattle, which was, of course, composed by a white guy. Um, indigenous people are neither weakened by nostalgia nor are they sentimental. They're not Rousseauian savages, uh, animal-like, 
and they're not Thoreauian reflective um, uh, uh, philosophers. Um, they have developed, however, a traditional mystique of the earth that's based not on the idea of um, directly protecting the earth, but on a far more subtle intuition. That's the idea that the earth only exists because it's filtered through the human imagination. So society after society after society defines its relationship with the natural world uh, through reciprocity, a simple idea. The earth owes us its bounty, but we owe the earth our fidelity. Uh, and yeah. that, that, that balance, which is expressed in cultures throughout the world, but particularly in, in the indigenous cultures of the Americas, is fundamentally different than the lineage that we inherited from Descartes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that, that brings to mind the, the Mayan uh, villages around Lago Avilan in Guatemala, you know, that were sort of that were far enough away from Spanish colonization that they sort of remained relatively intact and had that notion of feeding the holy. You know, the idea is that we do consume, we hunt, we fish, we chop down trees, we do all of these things. And rather than thinking that we've been cast out of the garden and need to atone for that, we understand that reciprocity that you're talking about and we give back. And in the Almost gifting... Every, indigenous societies never think of people as part of the problem. People are the solution. You know, in the Arctic, if a, a young hunter kills a seal and doesn't drop fresh water into its mouth after it's dead, he'll never hunt again. You know, you know, this idea that blood on ice in the Arctic is a sign of death that Greenpeace would suggest nothing could be further from the truth. It's an affirmation of life itself. They they believe that animals um, uh, you have to honor the animals, but that the animals also have to be hunted. Otherwise, they'll disappear. And and you see this and it has real consequences. So, for example, I always try to suggest to, to people of the West, you know, that that. Um, you know, climate change, for example, has become humanity's problem, but it wasn't caused by humanity. It was caused by a narrow subset of humanity um, that deanimated the world and consumed for 300 years the ancient sunlight of that world. And when Descartes, and, and again, this is not to judge our lineage harshly, it's just to observe it. And when we attempted legitimately um, to liberate the individual from the collective, to liberate all of us from the tyranny of absolute faith, um, when Descartes came along and said that all that exists is what can be measured, mind and matter, uh, in a single gesture, he deanimated the world and, and all notions of myth, magic, mysticism, but more importantly, metaphor were dismissed until, as Saul Bellow said, science had made a complete house cleaning of belief. A, com now, a complete what clean? House cleaning? House cleaning of belief. And, and, you know, the triumph of secular materialism may be the conceit of modernity, but it shouldn't, its dominance shouldn't suggest that it's the norm. It's the anomaly. And most, and most cultures view the world very differently. We tend to see the world as a stage set upon which the human drama alone unfolds. Trees and animals just props on our theater piece. Most indigenous societies don't view it that way way at all. So what, are the, what does that really mean in real terms? Well, if you and I are raised to believe that a mountain is a pile of rock ready to be mined, an inert mass, uh, we're going to have a different relationship to it than a people that are raised to believe that it's a deity. Yeah. And it doesn't matter who's right and who's wrong. It's how the interesting thing is the metaphor, how the belief system mediates the relationship with the uh, uh, landmark, if you will, with profoundly different consequences for the ecological footprint of the people. Yeah. And, and, you know, that's and, and, and that's why when, you know, the elder brothers, uh, you know, the Arawakos, the Kogi, the Wiwa and the Cancono in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta in Colombia, they, they literally maintain that their prayers maintain the cosmic balance of the world. They believe that their their rituals maintain the ecological health of the planet. They, 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 they refer to themselves as the elder brothers because they know these things and they dismiss the rest of us who have ruined the world as the younger brother. So, and, so, so I wanted to ask you about that. I, this, this specific, because was, wasn't this the Kogi? This was, or was this a yeah, different tribe? No, the Kogi are one of the four um, indigenous groups, all Chibchan language groups. They're <laughs> mutually unintelligible languages, but they all are descendants of the ancient Tyrona civilization in, and they live in the Sierra Nevada de Santa Marta. Okay, so and, you, and you, I think yeah, I've I've heard you tell a profoundly beautiful but also really odd story of isolation of the young initiates in in stone yeah. huts. Would you mind just recapping that because it's such well, a I mean, profound? They, they, 
um, you know, the, the, one of the th things that is so fascinating about the Kogi, but especially the Arawakos, is that they articulate their beliefs in, in, with such profundity and, and, and not with kind of, you know, glib platitudes like, you know, my people love the earth or my people live. But, you know, I mean, all that kind of stuff that I'm not saying it's not true or sincerely felt, but it doesn't take us very far. Right. But the 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 what the uh, the Atawakos in particular, when they speak, it's an incredibly moving um, full paragraphs of wonder and uh they, they 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 still remain ruled by a ritual priesthood. You know, they, 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 in the wake of the conquest, they've fled into this isolated massif where, for for the most part of two three hundred years, they're virtually unknown. And they, by all accounts, they kind of reinvented their their society from a warlike society to a devotional culture of peace. And I'm I'm not invoking hippie ethnography to say that. I mean, I think <laughs> there's a strong sense that the the intensity of the religiosity um, uh, of the, that complex of peoples is, in some sense, a consequence of the conquest. And this sort of this idea, like it was so violent, so sudden, so overwhelming, I, I, I you know, almost get the feeling that the, the, there's a collective sense: boy, we screwed up. We'll never mess up on the Great Mother again. I mean, I, I don't, I can't say that to be true, but you. You get that feeling, right? And um, so, that so in this sense, that they've never really been fully conquered by the Spanish, um, and uh, they're ruled still by a ritual priesthood. And the training for the priesthood, um, according to Reichel Domatov, who reported it in the 1940s, involved acolytes, you know, going into a shadowy world of darkness at a very young age, and spending two nine-year periods, 18 years all together. In this very intense initiatory process, whereby, according to Reichel, they never saw the light of the sun. For that, and, for that entire time. Well, that was what he reported. Now, uh, Reichel had never, and then he then he said after this incredible initiation, where amongst the central notions conveyed to the initiate, uh, the idea that, that the ritual activities literally maintain the balance of the earth. Um, the initiate, according to Reichel, was taken out on a journey to the heart of the world and for the first time in his life saw the true glory of the earth, you know, the sun, the, the moon, the, the horizon, the, the, the snow-capped peaks of, of Salanqua. So that, now, that's the I, sort of behold Kunta Kinte, Alex Haley's origins yeah. and roots in Ghana. Well, th th this was the idea. Now, th the thing is that Reichel had never actually seen one of these um, pilgrimages to the heart of the world, and he had never really spent time, he'd never seen an initiation. So, we, you know, it was almost a fable in, in anthropology uh, for the longest time, and I was always intrigued by that. I mean, I wrote about it in my f book One River back in the 90s, and, um, and then a, a kind of wonderful thing happened uh, by accident one day when uh, Carolina Barco, the, the, the um, Colombian ambassador, um, came into my office at the Geographic with, with a delegation of elder brothers, um, mm. uh, the Amamo, the Wiwa, um, the, and, and the um, Kogi, and, and the Arawako, led by a political figure, Danilo Riafania. And as Danilo is sort of um, pitching, I mean, in fact, what, what they were interested in, they're very politicized, very organized. And there had been a series of BBC films on the Kogi in which the old canard that Reichel always promoted, that the Kogi were the real spiritual ones, uh, the films had sort of suggested as much. And the Atawakos were pissed and they wanted their own film um, because they know damn well, which is true, that their rituals are just as broke, just as complex and, and that they hold up the world as much as a Kogi, you know. <laughs> and uh, so they were bringing this idea of doing a film to me at the Geographic. And I looked at Danilo and I suddenly said, you know, I don't want to be rude, but you look like an awful lot like an old friend of mine. And I pulled out a copy of One River, which happened to have a photograph of two Arawako men as part of the frontispiece of one of the chapters. And and it turns out that the guy in the photograph was Adalberto's father, I mean, um, Danilo's father, Adalberto, who had been murdered by the paramilitaries. Oh. And and then I said to Danilo, you know, I, son, you don't remember, but when you were a baby boy, I carried your, you on my back for weeks with your dad in in, um, in the Sierra. And Danilo just was so moved by that. Um, and we've become best friends since then. But he invited me to go back and, 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 I, and I said, uh, what I'd like to do is make a film of a journey to the heart of the world. 
and we went back and made the film about the initiations and we and and um uh you know by this point um uh we had been training the the Arawako and the Wiwa in cinematography at their request and it was fortunate that we had because as we were making the film we got to the penultimate stage of the pilgrimage and suddenly we had to abandon um the expedition because the FARC had um, set up to kidnap us. And, uh, mm. so we handed the cameras to, to the Wiwa to finish the last stage of the film. And we, we had to kind of escape what it's not a dramatic escape on a mule. You kind of clip clop your way to rescue, <laughs> but the thing we did have to escape this and it was quite dicey actually. But the, the point is that, um, what we found is that the acolytes don't spend 18 years in the darkness. That didn't really make much sense. But they do spend 18 years in the immediate environs of the men's sacred temple, much of the time at night in the darkness, learning the Baroque re religiosity of the, of the belief system. And they're on a restricted diet. They don't see women. It, it is a, a it is an 18 year initiation. Right. You know, that's why, you know, many people in a kind of colloquial way have compared the Mamos uh, as the Tibetans of, of, uh, of South America. They have that kind of intensity of belief, you know. Well, your story even of just that the whether it's Lago Adilan or whether it's the high country in the Sierra Nevada or or like the Bun shamans being too high up for the cultural revolution to to find or catch you know that that idea of retreating into rugged remote places yeah. to, to protect life ways now he, I mean have you come across the book Sand Talk by Tyson Yanka Porter he's a he's an Aboriginal professor down in Australia and it's a, it's a beautiful recent book that's just come out about you know, very, you know, he, he's trained in academia, so he's, he's, he toggles between worlds really beautifully. And one of his descriptions is effectively this difference between the Cartesian, you know, Western way of seeing things, false certainty, you know, precision, owning, collapsing things, versus the much more generative um, and organic ways of being. And then, you know, layer into that what you were just describing with several of these tribes and cultures you know, truly and sincerely believing that their prayers hold up the world, you know, that mm -hmm. that is part of the feeding of the holy. I found myself like just broken hearted and torn, um, you know, from way back when, when I was, when I was in school learning the stuff for the first time, but especially now where you're like, yes, it feels like we're missing something. Yes. It feels like there's malaise and disease in our worldview and our, and our, and our relationship to the planet we live on. And, all of those less agentic, you know, um, less material cultures all got steamrolled. Mm -hmm. So we can hold well, these high perspectives, but if we don't live, if we don't, if, how, do, how do we strike this balance between? It's a little bit like Father, I think, you know, it, it's true they got hammered. I mean, you know, uh, decimate. Uh, in Latin means to kill one in 10. It was the opposite. 90% of the American Indians and the Polynesians and, you know, got swept away by foreign disease. Um, but as Father Barry says in his book, Dream of the Earth, uh, the miracle is that they're still with us at all, right? And um, these these visions are visionary realms of, of different societies are here to to remind us that there are other alternatives, other ways of being. And you, you mentioned um, the Aboriginal people of Australia. I think that's a really classic uh, example that people can come to understand. You know, when the British arrived in Australia, um, and we know now, by the way, from studies of the Y chromosome, that the ancestors of the Aboriginals were the first hominids to walk out of Africa. And within 5,000 years, they had walked across the underbelly of Asia and somehow got across the... Um, the, the 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 sea um that was quick uh, I mean, that's amazing yeah, very, very quick that. yeah 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 very quick and um and, and settled the most parsimonious continent on earth establishing probably 10,000 distinct clan territories over the body of what is now called Australia now when the british arrived they saw people that looked strange um uh had a simple material technology uh, but what really offended the British was that the Aboriginal people had no interest whatsoever in improving upon their lot. And because progress and optimism and, and change through time was sort of the essential ethos of Victorian Europe, um, notions of progress and optimism that would die in the mud and blood of Flanders, but were very much alive during the period of settlement of Australia by, by the Europeans, 
um, the, the, the Aboriginal people deeply offended the British in a sense, <laughs> and and as a result, the British in their inimitable way saw them not to be human at all and began to shoot them. And as recently as 1902, in the lifetime of my grandfather, it was debated in Parliament in Melbourne as to whether or not Aboriginal people were human or not. As recently as the 1950s, ranchers in Australia had quotas as to how many abos could be shot with impunity who trespassed upon the ranches. As recently as the 1960s, um, there was a, a, a book used in curriculum across the, 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 the country in Australia, a treasury of fauna of Australia that listed the Aboriginal people as amongst the interesting forms of wildlife of the country. And what was missing was any ability um, to, to understand the subtlety of the Aboriginal mind and the essential notion of the dreaming and the dream time and the song lines. And the dreaming wasn't a, a dream as we would think of it. It was a state of um, existence in which there was no sense of, of past, present and future. There's not a word for time, for past, for present, for future in any one of the 670 dialects of Australia and languages. Um, there's no notion of past and present. The world at your feet exists, but is eternally waiting to be born in the realm of the dreaming. And the point of all this is, is that the people developed an incredible fidelity to, to place because it wasn't like they were wandering the song lines. Their, their main obligation was to do the ritual gestures along the places. And the song lines were seen to be the trajectories walked at the dawn of time when the ancestors sang the world in the beam, where the rainbow serpent laid its body. And there, the goal is that within your clan territory, you have to have to do the ritual gestures along the song line that are deemed to be necessary, not to change the world, but to maintain the world exactly as it was at its time creation. It would be like if all of Western thought had gone into pruning the shrubs in the Garden of Eden to keep it as it was when Adam and Eve had their conversation. Now, again, who's to say who's right and who's wrong? You know, had humanity as a whole embraced that intellectual devotion, we wouldn't have put a man on the moon. We wouldn't have developed allopathic medicine. But on the other hand, we wouldn't be talking about climate change and our ability to transform in mere centuries the living conditions for life on Earth. So, so again, you yeah. know, uh, the, 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 my, well, I, I wrote, how, how do you, where do you peg that? Because, the, you know, some critiques, I mean, obviously you can do Weber and the Protestant work ethic. You can, you can trace it all back through the Western tradition. I've seen some suggestions of, hey, it's, it's, it's the Judeo-Christian Alpha and Omega. It's the breaking of Uruburus, you know, from, from circular time into time's arrow. It's that break in causation and that sense of incremental progress that has effectively been the thing driving us forward and marching us off the cliff. Do you, does that track for you as you survey the world's no, cultures? Is it more complex? I, Is it different? I, I don't see it as, um, you know, that somehow we, I just see it as being different, you know, and, and uh, I, I don't think that things that motivate us today are informed necessarily by events that happened amongst the ancient Greeks, for example. I mean, uh, I, I think it can be much simpler than that. You know, we really did want to break the hold of, 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 the, of the church on our lives. You know, we really wanted, I mean, if you look at the, uh, the um, Jefferson Memorial in D.C., it says very simply, I swear upon the altar of Almighty God. He wasn't quite willing to reject God um, uh, uh, to fight all forms of tyranny over the mind of man. The idea that the mind of man um, could could be the arbitrator of life was an incredibly inspired idea. I mean, it gave us the enlightenment. It gave us a scientific method. It gave us everything we know about being modern. I'm not in any way denigrating it, but just reflecting that one of the consequences of it was this positivist tradition that said that the phenomena can't be measured, they can't exist. And, and this sort of deanimation of the world led to this extractive model, which, which served us well for a while, but is clearly not sustainable. You know, when I, when I wrote a book called The Wayfinders um, uh, about this whole issue of, 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 of culture, and did, uh, you know, a, a, an editor put a snappy title on "Seek," uh, you know, "Why Ancient Wisdom Matters in the Modern World." I didn't really like this subtitle because it included implied that these these visionary realms of the indigenous people were, were vestigial or ancient. They're not. They're contemporary. 
But I, I did have to answer that question in the book, and I ultimately did so in two words, climate change, not to suggest that we go back to a pre-industrial past or that anybody be kept from the genius of modernity, but just simply to suggest humbly that the very existence of these hundreds, if not thousands of other ways of being, ways of thinking, ways of orienting yourself in social, cultural, spiritual, ecological space, um, surely puts a lie to those of us in our own culture who think that we have no, you know, we cannot change, as we all know, we must change the fundamental way we interact with the planet. You know, the, the key thing is that every, you know, every culture is myopic, faithful to its own interpretation of reality. We think of ourselves as the real world and everybody else is a crude attempt to be us. You know, the Greeks did the same thing when Herodotus came back from his journeys in Persia um, play, and, and, and had the audacity to suggest something interesting was going on over there. Plato wanted him banished from Athens for betraying the, the, the su supremacy of the Greek world. Uh, the Aztecs had the same notion in, in, in Nahuatl. You know, the word barbarian is from barbarous, one who babbled. If you didn't speak Greek, you didn't exist. Most native tribal names mean the people. The implication yeah. is that everybody else is sound. The point is that we can't afford that kind of cultural myopia in a pluralistic, interconnected, um, dynamic world. And, and uh, this gets back to the central lesson of anthropology. Every culture's got something to say. Each deserves to be heard, just as none's got a mono has a monopoly on the route to the divine. You know, the other peoples of the world um, uh, are not failed attempts at being us. Every culture is a unique answer to a fundamental question. What does it mean to be human and alive? And maybe you could do a favor for me and get some kind of plug in for my new book on this uh, podcast, you know, Magdalena River of Dreams. We, we'll put the you link know. in. We'll do it all. Um, Great. So, so bottom lines. I mean, I mean, I would, I would love to come back in six months, nine months, whatever, and, and have more of this conversation. That there's so much. We are we're just getting going. We're just um, getting going. Absolutely. So, so Wade, you, you said at the beginning that you didn't quite know how you got into elder status, and it was just kind of a something that happened accidentally. But in knowing a little bit of your your career and your life, and even just a fragment of the stories that you shared today on Homegrown Humans. I have no idea how you fit all that in in, in, in 10 decades, let, let alone six. So um, thank you so much for joining us and congratulations on your viral Rolling Stone article on the state of things, on your upcoming book on the Magdalena River in, in Colombia. And thank you deeply uh, for all of your work and the way you have bridged worlds so skillfully for so many of us. Thank you. Well, I look forward talking to you again, Jamie. Thanks so much. Yeah, be well. This episode of Collective Insights was hosted by Jamie Wheel and produced by Jacqueline Loera. This podcast is for informational purposes only. The podcast is not intended as a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis, or treatment. You should not use the information on the podcast for diagnosing or treating a health problem or disease, or prescribing any medication or other treatment. Always seek the advice of your physician or other qualified health provider before taking any medication or nutritional, herbal, or homeopathic supplement and with any questions you may have regarding a medical condition. Never disregard professional medical advice or delay in seeking it because of something you have heard on this or any other podcast. Reliance on the podcast is solely at your own risk. Information provided on the podcast does not create a doctor-patient relationship between you and any of the health professionals affiliated with our podcast. Information and statements regarding dietary supplements have not been evaluated by the Food and Drug Administration and are not intended to diagnose, treat, cure, or prevent any disease. Opinions of guests are their own, and this podcast does not endorse or accept responsibility for statements made by guests. This podcast does not make any representations or warranties about guest qualifications or credibility. Individuals on this podcast may have a direct or indirect financial interest in products or services referred to therein. If you think you have a medical problem, consult a licensed physician. This podcast is owned by Neurohacker Collective.